Hey writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. I'm Tara Kremen, the Senior Manager of Author Experience. I'm Stephanie McGrath, the Publisher Operations Specialist here at Kobo Writing Life. So this week we talked to T.S. Paul, and he has one of the best bios I think I've seen in a while, so Tara's going to read it out for us. It's really good. So, T.S. Paul, made up of about 20% grape Kool-Aid, 10% fried chicken, and 70% creativity, T.S. Paul is an innovator. He's the guy that throws out the rules and publishes what he wants when he wants to. With three series under his belt already, he's gearing up for the next busiest year of his life. 2020 will introduce more than three brand new series of books to the world. Uh, Dipping into post-apoc and high fantasy, Mr. Paul will be the man to watch. What a bio. It's pretty, I would say, hits all the points I need to know. It's like he's a writer. (laughs) (laughs) Who would have thought? Uh, But yeah, so T.S. Paul talked to us about why he distributes wide, uh, some marketing strategies that I personally have not heard uh, on the podcast before, and then also he's relatively new to self-publishing, publishing, I think, his first book in 2016. So just to see how that has evolved to here we are now in 2020 yeah, so it's, it's a great, great listen so please keep listening thanks scott for joining us today can you tell us a little bit about yourself well i started writing three years ago in 2016 and i was sort of bullied into it by another author named michael anderley and we were friends and we talked for a while we talked about science fiction and fantasy and that kind of thing and he's kind of like one day he's like dude you need to write a book and i'm like i don't want to write a book so he bugged me for like two weeks you need to write a book so I'm like, fine, whatever. And I wrote something called The uh, Forgotten Engineer. And it's short. It was it was about 12,000 words. And right now it's about 15,000 words. We've, we've, I've expanded it since then. And it sold really well. you know. And, and I had once upon a time been a Walden Book bookstore manager. And I knew that new authors didn't make any money. And I wasn't expecting to make any money. You know, it sold a few copies the first day, and then the next day it sold a few copies, and the next day it sold a few copies. And I was like, hey, this is interesting. So, you know, I made like 100 bucks, $150. And I, I figured, well, hey, I've got money to take my wife out to dinner and put gas in my car in eight weeks. So I was like, great. But then it really started to pick up, and my, my friend was like, you need to write another book. So I wrote three in 21 days, all short. Wow. And it took <laughs> off incredible. like rockets. Now, I remember this was February of 2016. So by the end of the year, I had written 28 books. So I did 28 books in 2016. What, what length are we talking when you're saying that you're writing? Well, the books? first few were between 12 and 20K. Then I kind of capped it. was The series is called The Chronicles of Athena Lee, or The Athena Lee Chronicles. I'm sorry, Athena Lee Chronicles. And I had capped them off at 50 thousand words because I figured that was enough pages 150 pages 100 150 pages was what I was shooting for for that series so the first couple are 15k 16k and then after that it's 20 30 40 up to excuse me up to 50 wow. after book six they're all 50 and I managed to get 10 books written in that series by December of, of 16 at the same time that fall I was also writing a paranormal series which were 60 to 70,000 words. And those were selling like crazy on Amazon. <laughs> Sorry, your competitors. But those were in Kindle <laughs> Unlimited program. And those were selling like crazy. And suddenly I'm like, hey, I'm an author because I didn't have a job at the time. I had some medical issues. And suddenly I'm making more money than my wife makes in a year in a month. And I'm like, holy crap. So I'm, I'm suddenly, you know, independent on my own making a living income monthly by just writing. And I'm like, hell, this is a career. So going into 2017, I put out another 25 books, 30 books, depending on who you talk to. (laughs) And then coming up in 2018, I did about the same. So I have about 80 books out total worldwide on a variety of platforms. Some of them are short. One of them is a serial series, which is on Kobo. It's called the Jack Dalton monster hunter series and it was something i was experimenting with and i did a they're between eight and twelve thousand words they're complete episodes kind of like a television show where each episode has a beginning and it has an end and it has a middle and then the next book may build upon the previous episode but not necessarily and it's a spin-off of my paranormal series to where it's kind of like the ancient history part it's the part that takes place in the 1950s it's one lone monster hunter. He's in a van. He works for the FBI, and he has the entire United States and most of North America 
as his zone of influence. And he's all by himself and he has to track down vampires and werewolves and sea monsters and all kinds of things. So I did that as an experiment. So there's 10 books in that. There's, there is an 11th book, which is the actual box set that is up on Kobo. So that takes up 11 of the 80. But then there's a ton of other stuff. I've written some short stories that have, you know, they're out there published as standalones, three major series. I have two new ones I'm working on now. And I have a couple, like, for the future, I've got, like, six planned. I already have covers for them. So if I buy a cover, I'm pretty much going to make that series, whether I, you know, I've got skin in the game for it. You got into writing because of advice from another author. Do you think that you'd be a writer if indie publishing wasn't accessible to you? Like if you had to go to a Well, I was familiar with indie publishing when I worked in the book business, but mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I really don't. I don't have a background in English or English like writing English or English for school. Um, if my English teachers in high school found out I was doing this, they'd be horrified because my <laughs> grades were not the greatest in the world. And those people who picked up my book early on because I did not have an editor in 2016, well, I did by the end of the year, but I did in the beginning of the year, would be like, there's a few old reviews for the very early books that say, did a four-year-old write this? And, I, and I'll be, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'll be the first to admit that the, the books had some, some serious issues, but it was a really good story and people liked it. But as for me wanting to know, to know if I read it, you know, when my friend talked me into writing the science fiction, I had an idea in my back of my head for some alternate history that I had thought about writing, and I actually had already done the research for it, but I didn't think at the time that my skills were up to writing an actual book. About 20 years ago, I wrote some nonfiction articles for an online magazine, but that was 20 years ago, <laughs> and and I really, I really didn't know if I had the skills to do it or not. So when he said, hey, write me some science fiction, I was kind of like, can I do that? So I really don't know if 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 he had not put, gave me that push if I had done it, because both my wife and my parents had tried to get me to write for the longest time, and I wouldn't do it because I didn't think my, my skills were there. But at the time, I was also a heavy, heavy, heavy science fiction reader. I mean, I was probably reading 40 plus books a month. Wow. Do you think that reading um, that many books really helped hone your writing skills? I think it does, because a lot of people get wrapped up in trying to, to write the most perfect great American novel, the most perfect prose that they could come up with. And I tell people, just write what you want to write. You know, and if you're, you have a deep understanding of science fiction and paranormal, take what you want and, and put it out there. I've had other big authors tell me that, you know, there aren't, there's no such thing as an original plot. We all copy each other somehow. I don't know that that's entirely true, but, you know, you should just write what you think you should write. You know, if if you have a real, if you love mysteries and you love cozy mysteries and talking cats and talking dogs and talking whatever is is your thing, you should write one because you never know. The worst thing that can happen is it won't sell. It's not selling now because you haven't written it. Uh, My wife, who's not, is the furthest thing from a writer, has just started writing romance. And she's writing, um, well, this is funny because she's actually writing clean and wholesome and she's writing erotica under a pen name. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, and which I have not read, by the way. She did finish one. I have not read it. My assistant and my editor took care of editing for her, but I have not looked at it because I really don't read erotica. So, but she doesn't have any background in the writing. She's been listening to me talk for three years, but she doesn't have any background in it. So, you know, the, the being an indie is great because you can just go out there and do what you want to do. You don't have to wait on an agent for X years, you know, and everything else. One of the books that I have published that's under my company, which is out there, and it is on Kobo, is written by a um, Jean Paul, and it's called The Murderer's Diary, and that is my aunt's book. And when my aunt passed um, a year ago, I had had a promise from her that I would publish, that she would allow me to publish the book. My father gave me the manuscript, and I put it up online. But before then, she had spent a good decade trying to get representation and get attached to one of the big five publishing. And after I started writing, I'm like, you know, Aunt Jean, I can put your book up on Amazon or, or Kobo or whatever in a half an hour. And she's like, no, 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 I want to do it my way, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, once the manuscript was up, I don't know that it's sold a ton of copies. I have had a few reviews, one saying that I can't wait for book two, and I, she's not never going to write that one, fortunately. Mm. But it's, you know, as an indie, you have the capability of putting your book up in a half an hour. I mean, yes, 
you do need to have it edited. And yes, you need to have cover. Um, her book, by the way, was beautifully edited. It was one error, and the only it was only because she had one made up word in the entire book. But I I had to put a cover on it. She did not have a cover. As an indie, you know, you are responsible for those those parts of your of your mission of getting the the cover and getting the editing and getting the formatting and publishing it. But you can do it all yourself. There are ways to do it. YouTube is there. They have everything on there that tells you what you need to do. Yeah. So. You know, I have I've had a, a probably I had two dozen mentees, people who have come to me and said, "Help me, please," and I I help as much as I can, and I say, you know, this business is only as complicated as you want it to be. If you want to do audiobooks, great, do them. If you don't want to do audiobooks, great, don't do them. You know, if you want to have paperbacks, great. If you want to have hardcovers, great. It's all up to you to do it. Yeah, I really like the opportunities that um, independent authors have now. Um, and that they get to decide everything. It's just kind of like a really exciting world. And I love that you were able to put up your aunt's book. Like that must've just been really special for you. You um, started writing in sci-fi because you read a lot of sci-fi. Um, have you kind of yes. brought, um, have you started writing in different genres as you're writing 80 plus books? <laughs> yeah, um, I have, I'm writing in, well, I'm writing in paranormal, but it's not like paranormal romance or anything like that. There's no sex in my books. And for a while I was writing pretty much just for young adult. But a new project that I'm working on um, is a little bit more adult. It's more military fiction than it is science fiction. Um, but I have um, outlines and plans for some thrillers coming. Um, I did a couple of cozy mysteries. They're kind of paranormally, but they're paranormal cozy mysteries. I have some all that that alternate history project from 2016 that I was thinking about. I am still going to do. Um, I do have an outline of it. I'm I'm kind of in search of the cover. I like to have my cover first before I do it. It's kind of intricate, and um, finding the right cover designer has been kind of tough for that one. Um, and I have some plans for the future. I have a couple of really good ideas for something, some comedy. Um, author Barry Hutchins is kind of an inspiration. If you're if you're into science fiction, he writes a very interesting comedy series, and he kind of breaks all the rules for his cover. So it's kind of fun, and you know, it gave me the idea to write this comedy series that I wanted. I, I've met a lot of very interesting people in my life, and I always thought, you know, it'd be kind of fun to take all those people and put them on the same town <laughs> and write it fictionally, um, and hope they don't and hope they don't find out that it was me. So yeah, I've had some like I've had, I've had some fun with that. It sounds like you're certainly not lacking ideas. <laughs> No, 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 no. That's one thing for indies. We never run out of ideas. Yeah. Um, I have, I have brainstorming sessions with my assistant um, online and she yelled at me because she'll give me, she'll give me her idea and I'll expand on it. And she goes, she goes, you're insane. You've just given me six different variations. Stop (laughs) talking to me. (laughs) So we we have, we have fun with that. I mean, we, you know, we, we kick it around and come up with a different way to do it. And stand out from two books to six books to eight books to 12 books or whatever. I try and just make a big, giant, huge series because it gets complicated. You forget what you've done in book one and you have to go back. But what did I say here? So, yes. <laughs> so you're not, um, are you a plotter then or are you just kind of a pantser? Oh, I'm a pantser. Um, I've become kind of a hybrid of plotter and pantser, but I'm pretty much straight pantser. I, I like to say that I use the covers as my outline. A lot of stuff that the cover literally is the outline. That's the title. Um, it's like a tells me what it's about. I have been having to do a short paper pencil edit, but not not the beat system. I mean, I've got an outline right in front of me that has literally four lines, and that's it. It's just <laughs> wow. beginning, the end, and all the fiddly bits in the middle. Have you ever because, suffered from writer's block at all, or is it just constant? Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> chapter one is the hardest freaking chapter to write. Yeah. Once I get past chapter one, I can pretty much rock and roll and, and go all day, but you wow. got to get past chapter one and I'll start chapter one, throw it out, start chapter one, throw it out. I have one, one project that I've started. I have three chapter ones and I've been looking at all three of them and they're all different. And I've been looking at all three of them going, well, I can take this and use it for chapter two, but I have to figure which one's going to be chapter one. So yeah, once I get past chapter one, it's not that big of a deal unless I hit something in the middle where I kind of like scratch my head and go, okay, why did I go this way? Mm-hmm. I do know one author that is a pantser who killed off his main character accidentally. <laughs> How do you do that? Because <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't thinking and he had the situation come up oh. and he just killed his character off. And he, he wrote me, dude, I just killed my character off. I said, well, bring him back. He goes, yeah. He's like, he, he figured out a way around it, but it was like, you know, it's very much like that very old L.A. Law episode where 
you know, how they, they needed to kill a character off and the elevator opened and the person just fell down the elevator shaft. I was like, what? <laughs> so you, it happens, you know, you're, you're writing and you stumble over something and suddenly you realize, wait a minute, my character's trapped in an elevator shaft. It's falling. Oh, crap. So, yeah, you just you, you, you have to be careful when panting not to write yourself into a corner. Mm-hmm. Because then you have to write yourself out of the corner. And that's harder than writing yourself in. I bet. How many have you had a, like a record of the most chapter ones for a story? It was pretty much the most record so far. Um, what I'm actually doing is taking one of those chapter ones and turning it into the prequel. Ah, um, right. Yeah, I do. I've discovered I like doing prequels. My readers get a little fussy. They're like, just take, just take a prequel and make it the whole book, or or stop, or you know, stop. And I like to do teases too. I do like to do snippets, and you know, give them a couple well, paragraphs out of the middle of the book non-sequentially so i might the first snippet might be from the front part the second part might be the second snippet might be from the end part i don't tell them anything no no plot teases or anything Mm -hmm. so they get like an action scene and they don't get the beginning of it they don't get the end of it they just get the middle of it and they yell at me (laughs) but it's funny (laughs) and i keep doing it so they're like stop doing that they said because i have a fan page and they yell at me but I, I, I think it's funny. I do a lot of things because I think it's funny. So, <laughs> well, you, they're not going, they're not still reading your book, so I don't think it's a problem. They still buy them. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know, I do think because I think it was funny. I guess, and they know I, I get these wild hairs and decide to write something goofy. Yeah. Um, like I did, a, um, I did a short story called Serpent Con, which is a poke at um, uh, the Dragon Con event in Atlanta every year. And um, it has, two characters that meet real aliens dressed like cosplayers. So when they reveal themselves to be aliens, people are like, ooh, great costume. <laughs> and my, my wife just rolls her eyes and says, you're a dork. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, how did you build um, so that's the kind of stuff I do. How did you build an audience? Um, like, how did you get such dedicated fans? Did you do a lot of um, marketing work? Well, when I first started writing, I didn't have any money at all. I was I was living literally on my wife's my wife's paycheck, which was nothing. So I didn't have any money to start out with, and I couldn't really do advertising. I had to borrow fifty dollars from her to run an ad one day. But I didn't have you know any any income, and I also you know knew that that this was really hard because I did, did a little bit of reading and. and had friends telling me, oh, you need to do this, do this, but I couldn't do any of that. <laughs> so um, what I did is I created a Facebook page, and then I started doing social media aimed at people who like science fiction and cats. <laughs> you and got then, that crossover audience? <laughs> right. So then once I built up a couple hundred people on my author page for people who like science fiction and like cats, I just started advertising regular science fiction to those people. And it it somehow worked. And I created a character in my science fiction series based around a robotic cat. So it kept the cat people happy. <laughs> um, and the, the robotic cat is, is I based on my actual cat. And his name is Merlin the Cat, C-A-T-T, capital letters. So I created a Facebook page for Merlin the Cat. And he actually has 50 followers, which is hilarious. But I started <laughs> out with just a couple of hundred people on my author page, which grew to 5,200 on my author page for people who are following me. Mm-hmm. So I would, I still every now and then will post a cat picture on the author page just because we got to keep those cat people happy. They got me started back in 2016. But so that's how I started building my, my, my stuff on Facebook. Um, I'm one of the few authors out there that does not have a newsletter. Yeah. That, not seems, in three like, years. that seems like the number one thing that people always say is you need a newsletter. <laughs> I haven't had one, not in three years. Yeah, okay. And, you don't um, need one. It's coming. It is coming. We are oh. going to do one. I've been my assistant. I've been discussing it. We are going to do it in 2020. Um, I having, I'm having a new um, a website built. Uh, my old one crashed and burned, basically. I had a um, just basically don't hire crazy chicks. That's mm-hmm. just it's bland it right there. She kind of was a whack job, and she just turned it off one day. So yeah. so my... my um, um, my website is being rebuilt, so we'll be we'll be doing a newsletter, but not till next year. Um, I do have um, actually have ten Facebook pages that I'm, I keep track of, and some of them are major characters, like the Jack Dalton has his own page, and Merlin Cat, of course, has his own page. And I have a fan group, and I have my author page, and um, since I'm a my own publishing entity, a couple of the people who write with me have pages that I apparently run. 
They're like, oh, why don't you just create them? I'm like, sure. And I'm thinking, why do I have all these pages? So yeah, so I, I, I do a lot of social media type stuff. Um, not so much Instagram, but, but Facebook, um, a little tiny bit of Twitter. Um, I do a lot of really funky old school stuff. My newest, well, newest, the thing I've, I've done for the past couple of years is I had um, like old school pens made up. You know, you like go to the bank and they give you a pen and it's got the logo on it, it's got your address, that kind of stuff. So I make them up that say stuff like, why do unicorns eat pizza? Why does the FBI need witches? And it has my website on it with the link. And then every time I eat out, instead of taking a pen, I leave the waitress a pen. Oh. Um, I hang out at a couple of different restaurants that I write at that I go and hang out for all day in the afternoon. And almost every waitress in there know I have, knows I have pens, and they hit me up for pens constantly. <laughs> They'll see me sitting at the bar and go, you got any pens? So I always put some in my bag. It's like gr- that's like guerrilla marketing. It is. So I give away pens. Um, I've done some free giveaway like stuff. Like um, One of the characters in my fantasy series is a unicorn. So I do these unicorn giveaways on my Facebook page where I give away just people can uh, do a, I do a random generator or whatever, one of those things you do give away. And then they sign up and then I ship them, you know, a unicorn grab bag. And it's got all kinds of crazy unicorn stuff that I've built, that I find. My wife finds unicorn things like puzzles, notebooks with unicorns on them, pens with unicorns on them. Uh, at one point, a couple of years ago, I had Yeti cups made with unicorns on them. I mean, I have, you know, goofy stuff. It's, it's like a, gra- a random grab bag kind of thing. Or I'll give them a signed copy of one of the books and, and what the one that has the unicorn. And then, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So I do a lot of weird marketing. I have, um, I have pamphlets made up uh, with all my books and I keep them in the, the door wells in my, in my, in my, in my truck. And I've, there's been a few times when I've pulled up at a Burger King and people have asked me about the truck. So what I did is I had a, um, I bought a commercial vehicle and I wrapped it with the big giant sticker wrap that you see like on, you know, plumbers and electricians and that kind of stuff. Right. The only thing with me is mine has the book covers on it. So it's got this huge werewolf on one and the other side is the big science fiction thing. And you might have seen it when we were at Nink. It was part mm-hmm. of the parking lot. And so I'll pull up to a fast food restaurant or whatever in the drive through and they'll look at the van and they'll go, well, you like a writer or something? So I reach <laughs> into the door well of the car and pull out a pamphlet and hand it to them. My wife laughs. She goes, are you selling books at Burger King again? <laughs> so, you know... I really like that. It I like you're, that. you're having a lot of fun with the marketing. You're yeah. not really doing the traditional route. Well, yeah, you, you, being creative. Yeah, it, it is. It, it, it's a little fun. And I do do the other way, too. I mean, I have run Facebook ads. I do the, the Amazon ads. I do the, the marketing through you guys with your, your different promotions. Um, I was actually just looking at the Kobo promotions. Um, oh, fast here. I mean, you probably could tell from your end, but. Um, according to this, I have done, I've told people before, do the promotions on Kobo when they don't understand how Kobo works. So I've had 64 completed com- promotions with 53 declined. Mm, that's awesome. In, I like the, two years. the amount of um, promotion time you're using. That's really great. Oh, every time I see one out here that matches what I've got, because I have, uh, okay, pull that other thing up. I have, I think it's 50... 54, 54 books on Koho. And that's counting my, my aunt's book and um, um, another, um, yeah, my aunt's book. So then I have 54 books. So, you know, I, if something matches, I'll throw it up there on the, on the promotion. And that seems to help some. And I, and I run, I run, I've run, I've run book bub ads. I've had one book bub that they've, you know, they've, they've decided to say, hey, let's take a chance on him. It wasn't even book number one, which was a little crazy. I have had one book bub, but I have, I do run book bub ads. Like I said, they do the promotions with Kobo, um, which I have to like. I think it's, it's, it's very handy. Amazon's not quite so easy when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah. You're a very helpful um, kind of spokesperson for Kobo that you're kind of encouraging other authors and kind of like mentoring people um, through the tools that are available. Oh yeah, I, I help I help people constantly, and and I used I used to be part of the Facebook group Twenty Books to Fifty K. I was actually the first moderator for that group, and when it got a little out of hand, I couldn't control. I had we had to bring more moderators in, and now 
uh, Officer Craig Martell and a few other people now run it uh, for the most part. And I bailed out of it because it was too much of a, a time suck for me. Mm-hmm. You know, you start reading a thousand posts a day. You can't do that and still work. So I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I got out of there. It just gets over too much because, you know, you post something and then suddenly you get 50 friend requests for people who are these people. So I don't pay attention to that. Yet. <laughs> but I do still have people who, who pay me every now and then and say, hey, can you help me with this? Or how does this work? Or whatever. And I've helped a few local people, too. And, you know, they'll ask me about what, what what's the best place to push your book. And I pretty much give them the top three. No offense to, to D2D, but I pretty much tell them Kobo or Barnes & Noble or Amazon or all three or go direct with everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, and when they ask me how to, how to do it, I'll walk them through it. I was told by one of your um, – uh, Mark LaFave, you know, your previous yeah. – person with there. I, I had talked to him a couple of years ago. And, you know, when I went direct with, with Kobo with my 50 books, I'll even tell you, I said, last year I did $10,000 on Kobo. Wow. Which people kept saying, that's crazy for your first year because it's really hard. Well, why? It is really hard. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, and, and up to date, I mean, I sold, according to this, I sold 13,000 books on, on, on Kobo. I don't know what it was last year, but this mm-hmm. year. And so, you know, I mean, I, I do okay. I mean, a couple hundred bucks a month, which is fine. And it, it, it goes up sometimes. It goes down sometimes. You know, why? Oh, people are fickle. You can't control what people buy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it, I like Kobo. What drew me to Kobo was your Netherlands programs. Oh, the Kobo which Plus? Which is why I, yes, Kobo Plus and the fact that you have a representation in, in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. Because when I was still messing around back in 2016 trying to do different advertising routes and things. I use the Netherlands as an, as a, as an experiment. I threw money at Facebook. I threw a little tiny bit of money on Amazon and I advertised directly to the, to the Netherlands just to see if it was possible to build a market in the Netherlands because I was selling at the time on Amazon. I was selling like $2 a month, two euros a month. And I was like, that's nuts. Is there any way to fix that? So I did a bunch of ads that did all into the Netherlands in English, of course, I didn't try to mess around with language programs and managed to raise it on Amazon from $2 a month to $50 a month. And I was kind of like, well, that's interesting. So when I decided to go half wide, because half my books are wide, it was the fact that the, you had the Kobo Plus in the Netherlands that drew me to the to Kobo directly. Because I actually used Kobo first before I went with Barnes & Noble or any of the others. Nice. And what prompted your decision to sort of do half your books wide? Um... It's really great that you go wide and, and we understand that some people like write things that are better suited to different mm-hmm. platforms. So um, why well, did you decide it was going to work for you? Well, my science fiction had dropped off. Um, this was the stuff I did in 2016. And by the end of 2017, this, the science fiction, my science fiction series, and I also was not writing it, any, in it anymore. I stopped at book 10 and just couldn't do it after doing, one thing I didn't mention is that, that, in 2016, besides doing the 28 books that year, I also did um, – every week I was doing a free short story that I was posting on my website. So I wrote 40-plus short stories plus 28 books. <laughs> so by the end of the year, I was pretty burned out on, on, on anything Athena related. I did not want to even look at it. So I didn't, I didn't touch it up until recently. So I, I didn't – I just couldn't do it. I couldn't write it in the universe. I just couldn't stare at those characters. I couldn't do it. I was just so burnt out on it. So – that particular series has a has a pretty good following. I actually just got a, a text from somebody yesterday asking me when the next book is coming out, and I haven't written in that series in two years. Um, and I did tell them I'm going to. I'm going to have to finish it. So I, I have book covers for it, so I am going to finish the series, and I'm going to work on it this, this spring. But I just – the sales were dropping off on it, and my wife and I just took a hard look at it. And, yes, we took a hit by taking it out of the, the Kindle Unlimited program, but it was already sliding out of, you know, people weren't reading anymore because it wasn't a new book. So we took a chance and, and pulled it all out. It took about three months for it to slide out. Yes, I could have called Amazon and said, hey, can we take these out? But Amazon has a really bad habit of hitting things with a, a sledgehammer when they could use a ball pin hammer. So if you tell them, please take these books out, they might take everything out. So it's easier just to let it drop out by itself. I wasn't, I wasn't ready to just like freak out. And, and, and so I, I allowed it all to drop out on its own. And I, I worked a little bit with you guys, and, and at the time I was with D2D, and, and I had told them, hey, this is what I'm doing, and they're like, well, just let us know. And, you know, I started loading the books in. So as it as they all came out, 
I started out with the 15 plus books that were in, within the science fiction series, and then I pulled everything out that I had at 99 cents and made it go white too, because under the, the theory is, is that if it's, people are going to pay 99 cents or give me KU for, for a 99 cent book, which most of them are only 30 pages, I'm not making any money off of it that way. Just give me the 99 cents. I mean, I'm going to get 30 cents regardless. Mm-hmm. So I just pulled everything out, the 99 cent ones, and made them go wide. And then as I've done a few books, I'll take a hard look at it and go, do I want to keep that wide or I want to do whatever? Um, I have a co-written series called the Sm- called Smuggle Life, which is a spinoff of the of the original Athena Lee series. And I had written with somebody else, and I recently bought that author out, so I own them completely outright. And those I pulled out of KU, and those are now wide. So they're actually selling better wide than they did on Amazon and KU. So that that's, series. That's awesome. So, Kind of interesting. Yeah, I kind of I keep an eye on those things, but you know, like I said, people are fickle. I mean, you you can't figure what readers are going to read. I mean, from my own reading days, and from when I worked at Walden Books, you can't, you know, understand. It's really hard to understand what people are going to buy because <laughs> you'll see the, the damnedest things they buy. So you you just have to kind of roll with the punches. Yeah, we 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 try our best to predict that here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because you can't really predict what people are going to buy. I mean, you know, you'll get the greatest. People will say, oh, it's going to be the biggest bestseller ever. And I'm like, uh-huh, sure it is. That cover's awful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, cover, covers, you got to have a good cover. How don't often, listen to what the, what the traditional authors say. How often would you recommend an author, like, sit back and look at their sales and try to readjust some of their titles? You mean, what do you mean? Say, look at a different author? Just like well, sometimes so, changing just changing the covers will make all the difference in the world. I mean, there's there's a couple of of there's a couple of indie authors that I really like. I'm not going to name names. There's, I'm friends with them. I'm not really going to name names. And I have told them flat to their face, "You need to get rid of that shit on your covers." Sorry, <laughs> bad language. But the <laughs> I've told I've told them I said those covers are awful. I mean, and they're stock art, and and they're fine for some people but the problem is is that because it's stock art it's straight stock art they haven't adjusted it is that there's three or four other people using the same cover you know it's really confusing for people so we're we're kind of as indies we've we've become kind of like i'm not going to say we're prudish but we've become to where the trads are taking a step back and the covers are being simple are being very simple you know as indies we're all getting very complicated and and the readers don't know that you know too much of a difference, but they really like cool covers. I mean, if, if it's a plain cover with a picture of a cup on it, they're not going to get that. They're going to get the one that's got the dragon with the princess. And, you know, I mean, it has to be, we think it has to be intricate. So we spend more and more and more and more money on, on covers. I mean, I won't pay more than 500 cover, but I know people who have spent thousands on covers for just one. So, I mean, if, if you're looking at older series, your first step is change those freaking covers that's and good then advice. maybe fix the inside. That's good advice. It's something that maybe people don't overlook because they're like, I have a cover. Um, like, I've done this already. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, I, I deal with the local writers association here in town and they don't particularly like me. <laughs> and, um, and it's not because I'm mean. It's because um, they're very trad oriented. They want to be, they all want to be writers, but they all want to get agents. Mm. And the first year I was here, we moved here in 2017. And the first year I was here, um, I sat in the back of the room for pretty much a year listening to them talk about how they all want to be Indies and they all want to quit their jobs and they all want to, you know, write for a living and, and, and not have to do actual nine to five. And if only there was somebody who could help them with that. And they still weren't talking to me. And I'm sitting in the back of the room watching them and I'm thinking, um, okay. So, you know, they showed me their books and the covers are awful. And they're like, well, and, they're, and I would ask them, well, why do you have such a terrible cover? And they said, well, it's not the cover that sells books, it's the inside. I said, no, that it's the cover true. that sells books. <laughs> it's the cover. And I use, and I use this, this analogy, and I, I've used it a few times, and then, and then at Christmas time, it's perfect, because it's this time of year. If you go to like one of the big box stores, you know, Wal- um, Walmart or Target or one of those places, and there's in the, in, the, in the media area, there's always like a big bin of movies, and they're $3 or $5 or whatever it is, and there's always some guy with his head down in the middle of the videos, and he's got a cart next to him. So he'll reach down and he'll pull out a stack of, of DVDs and he'll look at the cover. He'll flip it over the back. He'll read the top two lines of the blurb on the back. If he likes it, he'll put it in the cart. 
If he doesn't like it, it goes back in the bin. That's indie publishing. You've got 10 seconds. You've got the look at the cover, top two lines, trash or keep. And it, it's down and dirty, but that's indie publishing. If you can't grab their attention with the cover and the top two lines of your blurb, you're screwed. Now, if people are reading um, online, and we'll use Amazon as an example, they have that, that additional emphasis where you can click on the book and look at the look inside and read the, read the first page or the first three pages, whatever it is. If the first three pages are a 40-page description of how to walk across a campfire like Robert Jordan used to do, you're screwed. You have to have some sort of um, emotional hook on that first couple of pages to grab people's attention or it goes back into the bin. That's how ebooks work. There's so many to choose from. You either like it or you don't like it. So you need to have a really good emotional hook to grab people on those first couple of pages or they're done. They'll toss it back in the bin and grab another one. I wonder if that's so, why you, you know, have not a hard time with chapter one, but why you put so much focus on the first chapter. Yeah, because you have to have something that grabs their attention. Um, my very first book, The Forgotten Engineer, and people, <laughs> if you look at the one on, on, on Amazon, if you look at it, people say, oh, my God, this is terrible, a four-year-old wrote it or whatever, because the, the, the punctuation, and I had really issues with it the first six months, and then I fixed it. But what made it sell books was the fact that it had an emotional hook in the front where in the first two pages, you find out that there's this interstellar battle going on. The main character is new. She's been on the ship a month and they see she's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And somebody grabs her and literally throws her into a closet. And she says, this is my very first battle. And I'm in the closet. Well, that was the emotional hook. And that was what made people like the story and want to read it. So you have to have something like that in the first few chapters, whether you do a flashback I've done that a few times where you grab a scene from the middle of the book and you make it the front of the book. And then you say, well, how did I get in this situation? And then you, then you start the real chapter one, which is now chapter two, which is in this hard to write, you know? So then you, but you want to grab somebody's emotional attention. You want to have them see that, that, that thing and, and reach for it. You know, you, you're, it's like watching an action movie. You've got some kind of explosion in the front, which grabs everybody's attention. Oh, you've got to re watch that star Wars. You know, it has the, has the words climbing the screen, but you know, it, it grabs your attention because you're like, Oh, this is going to tell me what's going on. Definitely. But if it's this really boring intro about what the, what the building looks like and, and you know, what kind of carpet they use and Oh, got to have that green paint. Nobody can read that. <laughs> and it has a co an awful cover to go with it. Nobody's going to read that. It doesn't matter that you've won the Sawgrass award or the pine tree award or the best rock on the block award. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares about that. Readers don't care. Other authors might care. But other authors aren't going to give you any money. I've noticed in the last couple months that I've been seeing people putting excerpts from the middle of their book before the chapter one. So it's interesting yeah. that you talked about that. Yeah, well, that's the same kind of thing. You have something in the front. Or you use the excerpt as the blurb, something, an action scene or something. I've seen that. So, I mean, you have to have something that grabs people's attention. If not, you're just, you're just a lone book in a sea of books. Because there's a lot more... A um, lot more competition now than there was two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. So, uh, you know, especially wide. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, where do you think indie publishing will be in the next five to ten years? Audio is a big thing. The, and I, I, I'm actually getting back into audio. I was in audio once upon a time, but that, that's, that's a whole different stuff. That could be a whole other episode of this. <laughs> we can talk about the good and the bad for audio. But the um, more the bad than the good, but yeah, it's okay. Um, I think the future is a lot of traditional writers are becoming hybrids. They're all becoming indies because we make more money. And I, I really think that the, the uh, I've been saying for three years that this, one of the futures of, of, of publishing is people reading on their phone. I read on my phone all the time, and so does my wife. And I think shorter fiction, as in not 500, 500 pages, but shorter fiction, as in 250, 300, or less than that, is the future. Because younger people like shorter books, especially if they're reading on their phone. I mean, but people don't buy book readers as much as they buy phones with an app. This book readers are still out there, though. You guys have a nice one. So does um, Barnes & Noble's kind of fixing theirs. And then, you know, the Amazon readers. But those have issues with them anyway. I'm not sure about yours, so they don't have one. But 
I do know if you if you get a, a Kindle Fire that you know you're limited the number of books that you can put on it. Um, on my phone, a good example is we lost power here last night for 12 hours, and I happen to have because it, uh, my phone uh, because everyone in this part of uh, town was using the the their phones. Uh, connectivity was an issue, and I couldn't download anything. But fortunately, I had about 200 books downloaded onto my phone. Yeah. So, you know, I can pull up out of the memory, and boom, I've got a book. I mean, yes, it's an older book, but whatever. You know, but if you're limited the number of books you can have on your reader, why would you have a reader when you have a phone? Yeah. So I think, you know, people – and you can adjust the text. It's not like you're trying to squint and read, <laughs> you know, a, a six-by-nine paperback. <laughs> So, you know, and we laugh when, when my wife buys a paperback. She's like, where are the buttons on here? How do you make the words bigger? We laugh. <laughs> but I think that one of the, I, think, <laughs> I think one of the, one of the things that, that, that is the future for us is it is going to be mostly digital. I mean, yes, people still want paperbacks. And yes, there are brick and mortar stores that want paperbacks. But I, I have paperbacks for my books. But for the most part, I only use them at Comic-Cons. People just buy them when I'm at Comic-Con. They don't really care about having them. You know, they want the ebook. They're probably buying it as an excuse to meet you and chat to you, too, in person. I was just at a Comic-Con, well, today's Monday. I was there Saturday. We had one local. And um, I actually did talk more than I, I sold books. But that happens every time. And I actually gave away more books than I sold, too. People <laughs> ask me, can I have one of your books? There are people like the other vendors. And I have I, I did the the prequel to one of my series. It's, it's thirty pages, so it's like almost like a comic book they're getting from me. That kind of thinness, and I put them in print, and they cost me like um, I think it's a buck seventy each is what I paid for them. And they're three ninety nine if you have to buy them online, but I don't make money off those. When, when I sell one online, I think I make twenty cents because I kept the price really low. Why? I mean, why why should I try to make money off my paper? <laughs> so when people say, "Hey, can I have one of your books?" I get a prequel, and I'll sign it. And they think it's funny and, you know, they'll read it. And if they want another one, they can order one or they can catch me and I'll sell it to them either way. But whatever. Yeah, okay. um, but I don't sell paperbacks like I sell ebooks. So but that's the are, future. What are your plans for 2020? Just um, continuing this ferocious writing schedule? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, my wife and I are actually going to do a, a, a series together. I've already got the covers. I've got about half of them. One of your fellow Canadians is my cover designer and she's just moved. So she's only given me half the series, but since I have actually started writing it, it we're okay. <laughs> Excuse me. The, um, I have, uh, six new series. I'm starting next year counting and still finishing up what I'm already working on. Yeah. Um, it's going to be some sci-fi going to be some, um, some paranormal. And then I have some, some new stuff, some new concepts coming. Um, I have a cozy mystery. I'm going to finish that up. I've got two books left to write in that. And then, um, um, I have a, a thriller thing that I want to do, some post-apocalyptic, which is um, something that I've started, but I haven't been working on. I have a cover for it, though. Just some variety of other things. Um, we're gonna, we're, me and my assistant are going to try to do our very first hardcover, which is a whole different thing. And, and I have an idea of, of uh, to do a great big, huge thing. And I thought, hey, let's do hardcover. And that's kind of interesting. And we're going to poke at that and see if we can figure the formatting on that, because that's there isn't a set thing for that. We have to kind of mess with it. And um, I don't really have any major plans other than writing. I just have a lot of things I have to get caught up on. Uh, I had some deaths in the family a year ago, and that kind of threw my writing schedule off a little bit. And you know, too many trips and and things like that. I mean, I go to the I go to mm -hmm. one writers conference a year, and that's the one at Nink that we I just was there with you ladies. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, if you're a writer, that is the best one to go to. A, a, a point in this industry, you know, the, the the trads have always kind of been looming over us like the the big brother we don't really want, but you know, we have to step up and, and, and join the real world. We can't just sit back and go, oh, you know, I just wrote my local local book or whatever. And, you know, I'm trying to do this. And you have to really put some effort into it. And, and if you're really going to try to do it, I mean, local local books are fine. You know, if you're selling like local history, you did a ghost story and, and you're doing local history and you're going to get the historical side to carry your book. Great. But how about shoot for that? Grab the brass ring and try to get somebody in Germany to buy it. Or somebody try to get somebody in Italy to buy it, or what? Well, Italy's tough to get somebody in Italy to buy it. So you know, get try to get get somebody else worldwide to buy your book. Um, I <laughs> I told some I've told people for indies that if you're writing indie nonfiction, local stuff, not worldwide, that's a different deal. But I said if you're writing, you know, my grandfather had this great story, and I'm going to write it down. I said, you know, the only really way as an indie to make money in the in the nonfiction market, other than like cookbooks, is if you were raised by wolves, where you saved Oprah from the burning building. 
or both. You were raised by wolves and you saved Oprah from a burning building. And you, you saved really Oprah cover. from wolves that were on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that. <laughs> so, because you know, we don't, as, as indies, you really don't have the marketing and the power behind you to push a nonfiction book to the fore. Unless you are writing about something prophetically that happens and you just happen to have a book about it. You know, like, hey, I got a book about that as this disaster happens. So, you you know, you have a chance to make money that way. But once again, you don't have the marketing to really push it out there to take advantage of whatever situation it is mm-hmm. um, for nonfiction. Yeah. But fiction, great. We can write any one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a big group of romance writers grabbed me and wouldn't let go of me. I mean, I was like, they hung out with me for like two days. Mm-hmm. They'd say, Scott, no, Scott, you've got to come sit over here and talk to us. My wife was like, okay, I'll see you later. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it was awesome to get the chance to chat to you there. It was fun. Well, thank you for joining us today. It's been great. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you're looking for T.S. Paul's books, you can find them on Kobo.com. Or if you'd like extra tips for how to grow your sales and self-publishing, visit KoboWritingLife.com. This episode was produced by Stephanie McGrath and Tara Kremen. This episode was edited by Kelly Robotham. Music was provided by Tearjerker. And special thanks to T.S. Paul for being a guest on our episode. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy Happy writing. writing.